Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical and a lot of virology, I'm afraid. Uh, thank you for watching, I thoroughly appreciate it. It's really quite a fascinating January, full of semiotic arousal and harbingers of goodness knows what. First 30 days of 2020, Tesla has gone from $418 to $650. Beyond Meat from $76 to $117 plus 53%. Bitcoin from $7,170 to uh, $9,300, uh, almost up 30%. That's from Melt underscore Dem. And uh, I wrote, I think my second article of the year was 2020 opens with a bang. And indeed it did for Tesla, Beyond and Bitcoin. Home thoughts, I like this tweet from MN Jug, who's in Melindi, welcoming February in style. And indeed, uh, he's not wrong. Um, uh, Parveen Kaswan, who I follow on social media, is a conservationist in India. Family guard. Few elephants from the family will always play this role. They will keep a watch while the herd moves. That's from Parveen. If a herd is big, say 80 to 100, there will be more guards. At least one strong bull will trail the herd. It will keep an eye from behind and keep pushing laggards. And you can see the same. I came across these elephants in the Savo, elephant Savo and a family guard, I do believe. If you've got time, there's an eight minute video of a visit we made to Mazima Springs in the evening and in the darkness you can see all these elephants arrive at the water. It really is the most extraordinary thing we've ever experienced. The Z plus security is a real thing. Since there is a kid, family will move slower. They can cover 20 kilometers a day comfortably. Parveen again and two short videos of the same elephants I showed you in the Savo and really you could, we heard them first before we saw them um, and they were and there in the back you see the elephant guard that Parveen is describing in his tweet. I've been reading Carlos Fuentes Burnt Water, what a book! His genius is indisputable. He has a fountain of the myths and spiritual past and present of his native Mexico, which he has revealed to us in many novels. But this is the first uh, 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 writing I've read. Beauty, passion and brilliance. Strangely metaphysical, jumping from the past into the present. Um, a very, very powerful uh, writer, I have to say. Political reflections. Wow, Jared Kushner. This is Vanity Fair. Palestinians have never done anything right in their sad, pathetic lives. Kushner, ever the real estate agent, gave a speech in which he spoke of transforming the Gaza Strip into a tourist destination. Kushner's plan is described as the Monty Python sketch of Israeli-Palestinian peace initiatives. Kushner got on a call with Arab and Israeli reporters and putting on his salesman cap, explained that his vision was 100% workable if Palestinian leadership would stop being so hysterical and stupid. Appearing on CNN, Kushner told Christian Amanpour that critics of his plan, of which there are a comically huge number, must divorce themselves from all of the history and focus on the deal he has outlined for them. This is a great deal for them. If they come to the table and negotiate, I think they can get something excellent. If they don't, then they're going to screw up another opportunity like they've screwed up every other opportunity that they've ever had in their existence. 
Taleb summed it up. The Trump peace plan is not about peace and not a plan. It is simply punitive capitulation terms, a la Versailles. Kushner, what I would encourage people to do is try to divorce yourself from all of the history that's happened over the years and read this plan. So really, it's, it's, uh, I agree with uh, Taleb. It's a Versailles and it's clearly untenable. There is no reason for measures that unnecessarily interfere with international travel and trade. We call on all countries to implement decisions that are evidence-based and consistent. World Health Organization's Dr. Tedros. WHO stands ready to provide advice to any country that is considering which measures to take. This is the problem with term evidence-based, almost always used with great ignorance of emergence and downside asymmetry, Chase Chandler. WHO Dr. Tedros praised China for its steps to prevent the spread of the uh, coronavirus. China deserves our gratitude and respect. We cannot ask for more. Xi Jinping was filmed dry coughing yesterday. That's from WB Yates, 1865. My article, which was written last Sunday, um, and just to speak of, to a few points, the precise origins of the coronavirus are yet to be established, um, I said, but pointing the finger at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and the Wuhan Biosafety Level 4 BSL-4 laboratory, the only explanation left, I said, is artificial DNA modification. I said, what is clear is that the CCP suppressed information until we reached a Groucho Marx, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes moment. Epidemiologists speak of tipping points. Malcolm Gladwell described the tipping point as the name given to that moment. In an epidemic, when a virus reaches critical mass, it's the boiling point. It's the moment on the graph when the line starts to shoot straight upwards. I read, had previously described it in 2014 as escape velocity, and I've written viruses exhibit non-linear and exponential characteristics, and this is the key point. I was also touching on the new hyper-connectedness of the world, the daily flights between Ethiopia, many daily flights, and even one between Ethiopia and Wuhan. And I said that Bole is the epicenter of the China-Africa interconnection and hyper-connectedness. And I said that I have to assume that the virus is already in Africa, but just not diagnosed. I said that's a racing certainty. Um, and then I was talking about how the markets bought gold and G7 bonds on Friday, and we saw that trend continue through the week. Um, Kawa uh, Moto update, this is the maker of face masks. That's precisely the parabola curve. Each of them feels unmistakably it is the parabola they must have guessed once or twice guessed and refused to believe that everything always collectively had been moving toward that purified shape latent in the sky that shape of no surprise no second chance no return um, i've previously said the coronavirus 2019 ncov is able to enter and infect human cells the ACE2 receptor via its spike protein. What is in the S region of the coronavirus? According to the Lancet piece, it encodes virus envelope spike protein for binding receptors of host cells, crucial for host tropism, which basically identifies how to target host tissue. Um, this is the Wuhan National Biosafety Laboratory, which according to that other article we read, has suddenly and magically moved itself. 
Day 15, January 30, chart update of published data. This is from Bianco Research. Uh, infection surpassed the total 60-day total for SARS. Mortality about to exceed the 60-day total for swine flu. Is China understating the data? Probably, but what they're providing is worrisome. As I said, it's about escape velocity, non-linearity, and exponential characteristics. It's a numbers game. The more cases you have, the more likely there are going to be mutations that could change the virus in a significant way. David Sanders, a professor of biological sciences at Purdue University, said in 2014 about Ebola. Um, and then Taleb, hurricanes are not multiplicative, some viruses are. The coro coronavirus infection rate is growth geometrically, very predictable since China started offering data. Um, I believe, as I wrote on the 27th of January, that the number is massively undercounted. This is a short video I found. I can't uh, uh, or, you know, um, speak to its bona fides, but it looks real to me. Dead bodies on the streets. And then I saw various folks saying, you know, it's just nothing like the flu and what are we worrying about? And I saw this remark from Susan ZH, if you doubt the Wuhan coronavirus, do not have high titra or virulence to kill affected people. Go to Wuhan and have a look. Um, finally, uh, moving on from there, picture by Dan Siddiqui. This is Delhi. Uh, the picture speaks for itself. As I've said on the 2nd of December, the politics of ethnocratic nationalism are a bust. International markets, let's have a look. Euro dollar 110.25, dollar index 97.957, Japanese yen 109.04, Swiss franc 0 0.9710, the pound 131.24, the Australian dollar 0.6709, India rupee 71.4322, South Korean won 1192.21, Brazilian real. 424.38 Egyptian pound, the only one of the emerging market currencies holding steady, 15.7976 and the RAND 14.7744. <clears throat> dollar index, as I said, just below 98. Euro dollar moving higher, 110.26 flight to safety. Japanese yen, classic flight to safety currency, last at 109.04. Commodity markets, look at this, the Baltic Dry Index is down 80% from its September peak. Take, uh, crude oil, it staged a turnaround on, uh, overnight and uh, we're currently at $52.84. Gold, which is a key, um, uh, um, key to watch, $15.76. Uh, 75 last. Um, this is the rise and fall of emerging markets from 1986 to 2024. Per capita GDP rise with special colors for the BRIC countries. That's Brazil, Russia, India and China from Charlie Robertson. A lovely visualization. Sub-Saharan Africa, FDI to Africa rose by 11% in 2019 compared to just 4% in Asia, while it declined by 13% globally and by 23% for developed economies, said President Adesina of the African Development Bank. <clears throat> There has been a China-Africa summit, a Japan-Africa summit, an India-Africa summit, Korea-Africa summit, Russia-Africa summit, US-Africa summit. What do all these countries see? They see opportunities that Africa offers, said Adesina. Youth unemployment must be given priority with 12 million graduates entering the labor force each year and only 3 million of them getting jobs. The mountain of youth unemployment is rising annually, he said. African countries should accelerate investments as well in the development of human capital, he said. 
Africa's growth is stabilized, says Dr. Hanan Morsi, Director of Macroeconomic Policy, Forecasting and Research at the African Development Bank. I tend to disagree with that and wrote about it on the 9th of December in an article when I said it's time to big up the dosage of quaaludes. Governments are failing in the fight against jihadis in the Sahel, uh, writes David Pilling. It must be the least known epicenter of global terrorism. Burkina Faso, a landlocked country in West Africa, is now home to the world's fastest growing Islamist insurgency, he writes. Only last weekend, suspected militants attacked a market not far from the lightly patrolled border with Mali, killing some 50 people. Thousands of people were killed last year. Some 560,000 displaced in a country of 19 million. Burkina Faso borders six countries, two of them Niger and especially Mali, are centers of Islamist insurgencies themselves. Geography and circumstance have rendered Burkina Faso a potential conduit for a jihadi insurgency that now menaces much of West Africa. Operation Serval, as it was called, was a swift success. As so often in military interventions, the follow-up has been less impressive. The French, rightly, had no plans for nation-building. Unfortunately, it seems, neither did the Malian government. The Islamist threat has since metacized. In Mali, central towns such as Mopti and Gao are in effect beyond government influence. Fighting has spread to Niger and Burkina Faso. The region has drawn fighters fleeing the crumbled caliphate in Syria and Iraq. The title of a Human Rights Watch report on Burkina Faso, during the day we are afraid of the army and at night of the jihadis tells you much of what you need to know. <clears throat> While this is primarily the responsibility of national governments, they're mostly failing in their task, they urgently need to build a social contract between themselves and those in whose name they govern. The Western response is almost as shaky. France has 4,500 troops in Mali under the umbrella of Operation Bakani. The U.S. has several hundred personnel and two drone bases in Niger, but nerves are jangling. Last month, Emmanuel Macron, angered by anti-French sentiment, some of it coming from government officials themselves, threatened to draw down his troops. He is right. Regional governments need to back the French or sack them. They cannot have it both ways. In fact, as I wrote on the 20th of January, from the Maghreb to the Sahel to the Horn of Africa, we are witnessing a surge in asymmetric warfare and the intrusion of middle powers. Salif Keita released a video on his Facebook page in which he tells President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita to stop subjecting yourself to little Emmanuel Macron. He's just a kid. And that was on the occasion when two helicopters collided in the dead of a Malian night. Um, I've written about Africa, given the new hyper-connectedness of the world. For example, did you know that there was a daily flight between Wuhan and Addis? And our flight Ethiopian cancelled scheduled flights, apparently, to and from Chinese stations, then reversed that decision. Um, and, uh, however, Kenya Airways now, um, uh, uh, Air Tanzania and Egypt have all cancelled flights. According to Lea Tadesse, the test results of four suspected cases sent to South Africa has become negative. Uh, um, so that's a small relief, but it's inevitable that I think, I estimate, there are more than 500 cases that have not been diagnosed. Prowling lions and corrupt officials block roads to Africa trade. At the frontier town, little more than a gas station and a KFC, he sits in line for two to three days in temperatures reaching 104 degrees Fahrenheit, waiting for his documents to be processed. That's only the start of a journey for Zukimzimbi, makes maybe twice a month, driving 550 miles further north, gets him to the Chirundu border post on the Zambian frontier. There, starting at a bridge across the Zambezi River, trucks snake back miles into the bush, 
There's no water, there are no toilets, there are lions, says the 40-year-old Zimbabwean. By the time he gets his load of tiny plastic beads, the kind used in many manufacturing processes to a factory on the outskirts of Zambia's capital, he's been on the road for as many as 10 days to traverse just a thousand miles. His trials are typical of truck drivers across Africa where border bureaucracy, corrupt officials seeking bribes, and a myriad of regulations that vary from country to country have stymied attempts to boost intra-African trade. Continent's leaders say they're acting to change all that. 53 of 54 nations have signed up to join the African continental free trade area. Only Eritrea hasn't. The African Union-led agreement is, be is designed to establish the world's biggest free trade zone by area, encompassing a combined economy of $2.5 trillion and a market of 1.2 billion people. The AFCFTA, said President Ramaphosa, will be a game changer, both for South Africa and the rest of the continent. It has to be if African economy is ever going to achieve their full potential. Africa lags behind other regions in terms of internal trade, with intercontinental commerce accounting for only 15% of total trade, compared with 58% in Asia and more than 70% in Europe. Supermarket shelves in cities such as Luanda, Angola, Abidjan, Ivory Coast aligned with goods imported from the countries that once colonized them, Portugal and France. Many of these governments, however, depend on duty income. I don't see how that's ever going to disappear, says Tertius Carstens, the CEO of Pioneer Foods. Um, under the rules, small countries such as Malawi, whose central government gets 7.7% of its revenue from taxes on international trade and transactions, will forego much needed income. AFCFTA will require huge trade-offs from political leaders, says Ronak Gopaldas. They will need to think beyond short-term election cycles and sovereignty in policy making. Taking those disparities into account, the AFCFTA may allow poorer countries such as Ethiopia 15 years to comply with the trade regime. <clears throat> there may be structural impediments to the AFCFTA's ambitions, iron or oil and other raw materials headed for markets such as China make up about half of the continent's exports. African countries don't produce the goods that are demanded by consumers and businesses in other African countries. In September, South Africa drew continent-wide opprobrium after a recurrence of anti-immigrant riots that have periodically rocked the nation. One of the provisions of this agreement is for the free movement of people. The Afrex in Bank estimates intra-African trade could increase by 52% during the first year after the pact is implemented and more than double during the first decade. The new AFC FTA represents a new Pan-Africanism and is a pragmatic realization that African countries need to unite to achieve better deals with trading partners, says Carlos Lopez. God willing, if the free trade agreement comes through, Africa can hold its own. In the meantime, there are those roads, about 80% of African trade travels over them. The trip is short, the borders are long, they're really long when you're laden and custom officers can keep you waiting for up to four or five days to clear your goods. Um, and here you see a queue building up as trucks wait to go through immigration formalities at Bait Bridge on the South Africa-Zimbabwe border. As I've said, on the 2nd of September, the continent is non-linear, which we're seeking to address through the AFCFTA. But what is key is the free circulation of our most valuable capital of all, our human capital. I said it will surely be a silver bullet, but it's some ways off, and we have to deal with it now. Moving on, in that article, I was also writing about the China emerging market frontier a feedback loop phenomenon and I said that feedback loop phenomenon was positive for the last two decades but has now undergone a trend reversal. The South African Rand is the purest proxy for this phenomenon 
and the volume of trade between Africa and China means the continent is on high alert for a coronavirus outbreak. Dollar Rand is at 14.8126 but could fall a lot further. South African Rand minus 0.86% so far this year. Egyptian Pound 15.7962. Uh, EGX 30 down 0.31%. Nigerian All Share up 8.15% year to date. Ghana Stock Exchange down 1.85% year-to-date. Desert locusts are the most destructive migratory pests in the world. It is the worst invasion in Somalia and Ethiopia in 25 years and in 70 years for Kenya. I wrote about this when I said, let's finish up in Kenya, where we are currently under a plague of locusts and Al-Shabaab attack. Enormous swarms of ravenous desert locusts, some blanketing as much as 2,400 square kilometers of land in the country's worst locust invasion in 70 years. Most African countries are already suffering from droughts and floods. Locusts of almost biblical proportions are the latest threat to impoverished farmers who have been pushed to the brink by recent climate-related disasters. Our staff in Kenya are battling swarms so thick they can barely see through them. A single locust can travel 150 kilometers and eat its own weight in food each day, about 2 grams. A small swarm of 40 to 80 million locusts covering a square kilometer can consume as much food as 35,000 people in a day. The biggest swarm in northeastern Kenya covers an area of 60 by 40 kilometers, three times as big as Toronto, and could hold as many as 190 billion locusts. Took me to Exodus, the plague of locusts. If you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail including every tree that is growing in your fields. They will fill your houses and those of all your officials and all the Egyptians, something neither your parents nor your ancestors have ever seen from the day they settled in this land till now. Luke 21.11, there will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilences and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. And then Revelation, when he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. I said it feels like a decade of semiotic arousal when everything it seemed was a sign, a harbinger of some future radical disjuncture of cataclysmic upheaval. Kenya is set to hold discussions with the IMF from March about a cautionary facility. We want to have insurance for extreme events. This isn't a bailout. We are more relaxed, said the central bank governor. They'll be coming at the end of this quarter, sometime in February or March. Kenya Airways has suspended its flights to Guangzhou. Overall prices for all properties marginally improved 1.2% over the quarter. Sakina Hassanali of Hass Consult. That's a mind-boggling situation and doesn't uh, chime with what people are saying. East African breweries reported first half 2020 earnings per share grew 7.362%. Revenue was up 10.3%. Uh, profit before tax up 9.085%. Profit after tax up 9.079%. Cash, equiv cash equivalents up 38%. Interim dividend per share up 20%. And that's the important point to note. And an important signal. Group volumes grew by 5%. Uh, leveraged innovations to drive sales. New brands contributing 28% of revenues. Tusca Cider, Hop House 13 Lager, Guinness Smooth, Sakara Cider, Black and White Whiskey, Smirnoff X and Triple Ace Vodka and Uganda Warigi. Gross improve, profit improved by 14%, profit after tax 9%, calmer political operational environment, um, net sales up 10%,
Kenya, the largest market, grew 8% with beer and spirits growing by 6 and 11% respectively. Senator Keg, iconic low-priced beer, grew by 20%. Remarkable performance of black and white. Uganda Brewery's premiumization delivered a better mix and margins, helping lift net sales by 10%, driven by 15% growth in beer. Launch of black and white whiskey helped lift Uganda's scotch performance with net sales rising by 84%, while the ready-to-drink category grew by 18%. Serengeti Brewers in Tanzania uh, was the fastest growing business, expanded by 19%. We are pleased by this performance, Andrew Cowan. Although excise duty escalation on alcoholic beverages in Kenya's last budget impacted bottled beer, a more stable operating environment provided an opportunity to continue our growth momentum during the period. We remain cautiously optimistic about our second half of the year, although unpredicted tax and regulatory changes and challenges in our operating environment continue to present political risks on the horizon. So very good results. The interim dividend increase is a, is, a, is a strong statement. Lots of innovation, broad-based uptick across these three areas with Tanzania outperforming. This is the breakdown of the revenue. Then I looked at the parent results, which is quite interesting. Um, uh, Africa, second fastest growing for Diageo. I was surprised to see tequila, organic net sales grew 31%, that's interesting. Net sales of scotch malts up 17%, that's good. All regions contributed to broad-based organic net sales growth up 4.2% for the parent. Nairobi all shares down 2.45%, NSE20 is down 1.97%. Thank you for listening.